Snake bite kills, it maims. <laughs> Can you imagine the distress of, of running from your home, perhaps in the night, with a child on your back, suffering from snake bites, screaming in pain? It's a panic unlike anything you or I have ever known. A panic five million people will endure each and every year. It's the panic of not knowing if you or someone you love will have days or hours or minutes to die. People are traveling more than 20 kilometers on foot to access an health facility from wherever they are. They are the sounds you never want to hear. The wounds of a life-altering event you never want to see. It's a fact that saving a life comes at a cost. It means going from just scraping by on this earth to a level of financial ruin that destroys families for years to follow. And sometimes, the struggle to make it to a hospital ends on the side of the road. A teenager bitten by a black mamba. The fast-acting venom gives you little time and even less hope. They knew that he wouldn't be able to get to hospital in time. And so they laid him out with a bottle. There was a bottle of water there for him to drink. And he died there, and he was left for the hyenas. It's an epidemic of the tropics. It's the world's most ignored way to die. Dying from snake bite is nothing new. It's been happening forever, and it will continue until the world finally takes notice. Beautiful country, isn't it? But pretty yeah. dangerous. Dr. Robert Harrison has been taking notice of this tragedy for the past two decades. Okay, let's go, George. This exhaustive research trek deep into remote Kenyan hill country is something Harrison and his Kenyan colleague George Amandi have seen countless times before. He's back in Kenya to gather data to understand the plights of the victim. So this is the father? What he learns will help him better advocate for the crisis at hand. Can you imagine coming down this road to try and get treatment for snake bite? I can't believe it. Dr. Harrison has come from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine in England, and he's racing time a continent away, developing an important solution to save thousands of lives all across sub-Saharan Africa. Seven-year-old Chepkeman suffered at the fangs of a cobra not once in her young life, but twice. A bite on each of her hands, a little more than a year apart. They were cooking the evening meal. Yeah. Uh, the child was seated over there. So over a sudden, uh, the mother heard the child scream. I decided to run for the motorcycle as the wife carried the child on her back. Two times in a lifetime, her parents endured this same unbearable panic, running kilometer after rocky kilometer, not knowing if there would be transport once they finally reached the main road. And that delay has a, quite a significant impact on the likely success of treatment. And it's that that we need to know. It's that that we need to register. And can we ask how much pain the girl was in? Was she having trouble breathing, that sort of thing? Lots of pain. 
When we were at the hospital, the head of the child and the chest was all swollen. Chapkaman was lucky to have first arrived at a hospital that even had the frequently elusive antivenom. Her mother stayed by her side in the hospital for four long months until she finally recovered from a skin graft. After the operation, that's when it started contracting backwards. The total bill for the hospital was 130,000 shillings. 1,300 US dollars for a man who once made around a dollar a day. This is where his herd of goats was once kept. So he sold 25 goats, 25 goats to buy the treatment for his kids, and now he has no source of income at all. Huge gaps here, They're all over. There's nothing to stop the snake getting in. Yeah. sleeping on the floor, they're storing water and food in here, which will attract rodents, rodents sure. attract the snakes. Things most likely will not change for this family. No money to clothe their youngest. No way on earth to afford materials to patch the holes in their hut. An invitation for perhaps another snake looking for water when there's none outside. Most victims of snake bite are amongst the most impoverished levels of the community. They're nearly all agricultural workers, farmers, herdsmen, who live in a snake-infested environment. And the city dwellers may be genuinely ignorant of the plight of people who live perhaps only a few miles away and who are the food producers for the country. Selvarasu used to climb his own coconut trees. He was a proud farmer. He made a good living. All that changed one fateful, balmy southern India night. It was 10 p.m. one evening in late 2012 when Selvarasu headed out to his fields, a nightly ritual to stop the excess flow of water. When I came to this spot, there was a stick-like thing. It got stuck in my foot. It was not a stick. It was a violent strike from the feared Russell's Viper. It bit me on the lower part of my leg. There was a stone. I took the stone and then I threw it at the snake like this. A half-conscious Selvarasu was rushed to an understaffed government hospital. There was no anti-venom. He was turned away. The medical officer said to one of the nurses inside, the guy should have died by now. Why did you waste time to bring the dead body? Over the next few days, Selvarasu would be shuffled around to multiple private hospitals. I ended up staying in the hospital for 55 to 60 days. We knew that we couldn't stay until I was fully cured. And we had no way to pay my bill. So we came back home. Selvarasu still struggles to pay off his debt. He earns less money now because he has to pay someone else to climb his trees. His wife now shells peanuts to earn extra income. But still, it's nowhere near enough. Fees for their children's school are past due. A notice says they must be paid or the children will be expelled. It's one of the last things they own, a necklace to be sold to pay for school. This is something that should never happen to anyone. No one should ever suffer like this. I can't think of any country where forcing a person to, to take their kids from school, to go into debt, 
meets any definition of social justice. Farmers like Selvarasu risk their lives every day because there is never just one snake in a field. These men are local snake catchers. They've been hired by this farmer to clear his 10 acre farm of venomous snakes to make it safer for his workers. It's a cobra. On an average day, these four men will collect between 50 and 100 venomous snakes on a farm of this size, but none will be killed. Snakes are highly revered in India, so when the snake catchers are done, they'll release the snakes far away from any farmlands or populations. No matter what kind of venomous snake it is, the long-term consequences from a snake bite can be devastating. We've seen death, we've seen disability, we've seen disfigurement, we've seen deprivation, we've seen destitution from snake bite. When you look at the scale of, of the problem of snake bite, um, 125,000 people are dying from snake bite every year. 125,000 people die. That's like watching the entire population of Topeka, Kansas, or everyone in Bern, Switzerland, vanish. Compare snake bite to Ebola. Ebola claimed roughly the same number of lives in the 26 month recorded crisis as those who die from snake bite every month. Snake bite is a killer of more people than we know about. From Vietnam to Pakistan, from the Central African Republic to Latin America, if you just begin to color a world map where reported death tolls and estimates are over 1,000 people per year, anchored by India with 46,000, it's a map that quickly becomes more stained. Add in the countries which have 50 or more deaths a year, and suddenly, the magnitude of humans leaving this Earth is astonishing. But the burden goes far beyond the 125,000 deaths. Some two to three times that number are maimed. They're left with amputated limbs or suffer from lifelong disfigurement. <laughs> And those are the people who actually make it to a hospital to be counted. Snake bite experts the world over claim these numbers go even higher. The vast majority go to traditional healers, traditional medicine men. Healers like this woman, Esther, who believes rubbing a black stone over a bite will draw out the deadly venom. I have never seen anyone die here. Maybe they died while coming here. But once they've reached here, they all get better. To my knowledge, I've treated over 680 people. But the effectiveness of this traditional healing is, is something that we greatly question. But that's what people are forced. Forced because of a long-held cultural belief the traditional healers save lives. Well, they're locally available. They're right next door. A lot of this is, is going on, and, and all it does is delay that victim getting to effective health care. But if there is no anti-venom in their hospital, they're not going to get it anyway. Whatever the numbers may be, the true figures go beyond any data, beyond any study. The only way you can truly understand snake bite is to walk into any hospital or any village. Everybody knows somebody who's had their lives turned upside down. Snake bite is something that they fear more than malaria or tuberculosis, or in some cases, even more than HIV AIDS. 
There was a study done in Sri Lanka demonstrating that the long-term mental illness of snake bite was greater than the tsunami. That is how important snake bite is to these rural remote communities that suffer. That fear stems from the fact that snake bites are random. Nobody knows when or where a snake will strike. Five million people are bitten every year. But snake bites aren't like communicable diseases. Snakes know no borders. They're everywhere. And that's why what we captured in these few villages is the same in every neighboring village, neighboring county, country after country. You cannot understand snake bites if you are not a victim. Until when you are a victim or you are you've seen with your naked eyes the victim who has been bitten is when you can believe. Residents of Barango County, Kenya, are gathering with local leaders for what's known as a baraza, a community forum. They want to tell the world how snake bite ruins lives. And these are people that are voiceless, you have to remember. No one really speaks up for them. Okay, so the people raising their hands have been bitten by snake. Now you can help us, because most of these people don't have legs. They don't have arms. Others are injured. They can't do anything for themselves. I want to say that the people need to come from overseas to come and help us, because the problem is real. Living with the fear or the physical consequences of a snake bite is bad enough. Losing a loved one to snake bite is even worse. This family knows both realities. Your child wakes up screaming. You pick her up to comfort her. The mother held the kid and tried to console her, asking what's wrong? Why are you crying? But the kid kept crying. And then, imagine this. Within seconds, your other daughter starts screaming. We asked the other kid what the problem was. And she said, I have a pain in my hand. So we realized that there was something inside the house. So we took the flashlight then, we found the snake lying under the bed. In these minutes of unspeakable panic, a desperate call is made to secure a neighbor's motorbike. In that time, the first girl stops screaming. Her body goes limp. She's died in her mother's arms. Now the race began to get little Chepchachur to Maragat Hospital some 60 kilometers away. But like so many rural hospitals throughout the developing world, the stock of anti-venom had been depleted. It would take another four hours to reach a third and final hospital, a delay that allowed the venom enough time to consume her small body, attacking and killing tissue and organs as every minute passed. Chepchachur will live the rest of her life with a severely deformed hand. She's now blind, unable to speak, she cannot walk, and she has no control of her bowels. This little girl will never marry. All this from one snake bite. From Africa's puff adder and black mamba to India's cobra and stealthy crate, just how do these creatures, who on the one hand are vital to the ecosystem of a farm, saving crops from rodent devastation, just how do they make you suffer? Snake venom, simply put, is made up of a complex chemical cocktail. Venoms differ between species and even within species such as the venom of the Russell's viper in southern India, which has a different makeup than the Russell's viper in neighboring Pakistan. This makes it extremely challenging to produce a single anti-venom 
to combat all snake bites. Snake venoms cause three main types of toxic actions. Some can make you bleed to death due to the actions of hematoxins. Some kill by quickly paralyzing respiratory muscles, making it impossible to breathe. This is due to the action of neurotoxins, and others can destroy tissue at the site of the bite. This is a consequence of cytotoxins. Now, here's the catch. Some snakes have a combination of one or more of these venom categories, making it even harder for physicians to treat victims effectively, especially in smaller rural health facilities. This woman is lucky. She's at TCR Multi-Specialty Hospital in Krishnagiri, India, a private facility specializing in snake bite, owned and operated by Dr. C. Sundaraj. We don't want any person to die of snake bite. So that's how we give a good success rate in our hospital for the snake bite cases. TCR is well known in the region. So average job we see about 30 cases per month. But to be cared for here comes at a high cost, a burden that can put families into financial ruin for two to 10 years. This is a Russell's Viper bite. The venom of the Russell's Viper is one of those with the lethal combination of hematoxins, neurotoxins, and cytotoxins. Within 20 minutes, he was rushed to our hospital. So we have started our treatment. 26-year-old Perius Sammy has just arrived at TCR. He and his family acted fast. They killed the Russell's Viper and immediately transported the victim and snake to TCR. Knowing the snake's identity will help Dr. Sundaraj know what medical signs to watch for. Right now, Perry Sammy is fully alert and conscious. I was walking four kilometers on the way home from work. When I stepped on it, it bit me. I can treat him by ASV. We give, for Russell Swiper, we give 30 vials of ASV. These antivenoms are powerful drugs. In some cases, dangerous side effects complicate life-saving treatment. You could develop some of the anaphylactic reactions. Any reaction comes, we face it and we can do it. So how is this life-saving antivenom made? First, you need some venom and a brave scientist to essentially milk a specific snake. Now you need a large animal that's immune to venom. We'll use a horse. A very small amount of the extracted toxin gets injected into the animal. The horse's immune system kicks in and starts creating antibodies to fight the poison. After a number of weeks, large amounts of blood is drained from the horse. The blood is separated because the only part of the blood scientist wants is the plasma. That's where the venom-destroying antibodies are. The red blood cells are given back to the horse, and the plasma stays in the lab. The antibodies are purified and ultimately used to produce a safe and effective antivenom. Antivenom production is labor-intensive and expensive. While stronger manufacturing practices have been put in place, the basic way of making it using horses, that is, hasn't changed since 1894. A victim can only hope that whatever serum they receive has come from a company with strong manufacturing practices. Antivenoms that are not fully refined can often lead to a life-threatening anaphylactic reaction. Suddenly he became uh, profuse sweating, his BP has dropped, and uh, becoming drowsy. Back at TCR Hospital, Perry Asami has just received his first 10 vials of antivenom, and his condition deteriorates quickly. We can't exactly predict or say that ASV has cost us, but you see the Russell Swiper 
That's a very potent toxicity is there. That's a bad sign. Becoming unconscious. His oxygen level also came down to 80%. So I need to go for the ventilation and protect his airway is very important. Because if he, while vomiting, if he aspirates and it goes to the lung, that's the worst situation we are going to face. That is ever worse than this snake bite. ASV, right now, presently, we have stopped the ASV, but still, I want to give ASV. Because for snake bites, ASV is the treatment. So now, I have stabilized the patient, I, I, I'll raise the BP and uh, go for ASV. Any, whatever we face, ASV is going to save his life. Harry and Sammy's life will hang in the balance for the next 24 to 48 hours. Dr. Sandaraj will monitor him around the clock. Unlike government hospitals, patients at TCR pay for their antivenom and all related hospital costs. But perhaps unlike government hospitals, TCR has the life-saving equipment and a constant antivenom supply. So I usually keep in a maintenance of 300 vials minimum. We were unable to film inside any government hospital, so we don't know about their snake bite treatment. But many victims we spoke with in rural areas were like Selvarasu, turned away, were told there was no anti-venom available. This in a country with four main producers making upwards of one and a half million vials a year. It boils down to not knowing how much is needed. After all, a reputable study shows 46,000 annual deaths, but the Indian government claims the number is 1,350. <coughs> the success of antivenom production throughout the world calls for three things, a product that's safe, effective, and affordable. Today, in most of Sub-Saharan Africa, nothing checks all three boxes. Crisis is a good word for what's happening at the moment. The platform for making, manufacturing, providing, and procuring these antivenoms has collapsed. I've come for and this next venom. I don't know whether you have some. Cabernet Hospital in Barango County, Kenya, is the main county facility for snake bite victims. Even here, they struggle with erratic supply. Oh, so yeah. this, is it. this is the only one left? Mm -hmm. You mean this is the only one left in the whole hospital? Antivenom is very scarce. It, it comes and then it gets finished. Then we stay without it for some time. To gather data about the antivenom crisis, Dr. Harrison travels to this rural health center. This is a supply. At times, we don't have any, any supply. Marigat and smaller rural health facilities face even higher incident rates because they're closer to remote victims. But anti-venom here is a roll of the dice. On this day, Marigat's pharmacy had a small stock of anti-venom, but it's not the safest or most effective. That product has totally disappeared from this fridge and every fridge across sub-Saharan Africa. The product was Fav Afrique, produced by the French pharmaceutical giant Sanofi Pasteur. So Sanofi reduced the production of their excellent product, Fav Afrique, which is effective against virtually every snake in, in sub-Saharan Africa, but it wasn't making any money. What is there in place to take over? Nothing. While it was safe and effective, it was not affordable. It was $140 a vial. You probably need five vials for an average treatment. Do the math, $700 for a treatment. It doesn't include the costs of the physicians, the nurses. With such a high price tag, it rarely ever reached where it was needed most. A common, tragic gap causing death and disabilities to rise dramatically. I will ask you that question as to why those who are manufacturing the antivenom are backing off, leaving alone my India to produce for us these drugs that we're going through now. Indian antivenom sold to Africa? 
It's the only product currently stocked in that Marigat hospital refrigerator. Prepared against cobras, mambas, puff adders, and saw scale vipers. These Indian anti-venoms are attractively priced at around $20 per vial. Indian anti-venoms used for snake bite in uh, sub-Saharan Africa are mostly inappropriate, ineffective, and potentially harmful. The physician sees this is an antivenom. He knows that if one vial doesn't work, he should give another vial. That doesn't work. He's giving another vial. He might be giving 10, 20 vials. At times, this antivenoms, they create adverse reaction, drug reactions, yes. and some medical workers, they are, they are scared of that. And the physician is having to deal with this as well as the effect of the snake bite on its victim. Some die after even they had been administered. That's not to say the Indian products aren't working, to some degree. But many rural hospitals don't have the proper equipment to deal with these life-threatening complications or the proper training to handle them. He's, he got a snake bite. Yeah. Yeah. You are written here. Yeah. For ministers of health at the county at levels, like Dr. Andrew Kwanyiki, it's not just a matter of high cost, but also priorities. We have other diseases like malaria, like TB. TB in Baringo is, is subsidized, but it is free. HIV AIDS retrovirals is, is, is free. So comparing the ones which are free to the ones which are cheaper, like anti-malarial and the anti-venom, which is very expensive, we opt for the cheaper ones. Malaria, HIV, TB, filariasis, schistosomiasis, all of these are supported very significantly by a huge variety of, of international health agencies and governments. Snake bite does not get that support. So who is going to lead to make change happen? I've always argued that the WHO, because of its cachet, because of its penetration in all parts of the world, is the most promising international body that should be able to should be helping us to promote snake bite. The World Health Organization has a list of 18 neglected tropical diseases that are well-funded through WHO-supported advocacy programs. Most are diseases of the rural poor. Some you may know, dengue, river blindness, rabies. If you add up the numbers, snake bite claims the same number of victims each year as most of these neglected diseases combined. Snake bite is the most neglected of all the so-called neglected tropical diseases. I cannot understand. Professor David Worrell of Oxford University has been on the front lines of snake bite, advocating for victims and studying the plight for over 40 years. The problem is that uh, I've suffered with WHO a series of disappointments over the years. Only once in the history of snake bite was there a glimmer of hope. In 2009, Worrell and other advocates had reason to rejoice. The World Health Organization added snake bite to the list of neglected tropical diseases. We were thrilled. Hope raised. It didn't happen. It did not happen. Not long after snake bite made the list, it fell off, eventually being listed in the category of other neglected conditions. And what does that do? It make sure that the snake bite victim is further neglected. In late 2015, Doctors Without Borders called them out. They published a press release claiming the WHO failed to actively address snake bite even when Sanofi Pasteur stopped producing Fav Afrique. The WHO responded one week later. We really at a, a watershed moment, I think, uh, in support for the field. And uh, I think the situation is getting even worse. The WHO's Dr. David Wood attended a meeting of snake bite advocates from around the world to make a statement. WHO, we are going to be announcing uh, an action uh, to uh, open a window for pre-qualification for antivenoms. That's Progress. The WHO will begin to approve or reject the quality of all antivenoms around the world. But snakebite still isn't on that NTD list yet. It's a great start, but
But how long can young Perry Asami and thousands of others fighting for their lives wait for change to reach them? It's morning at TCR Hospital. Perry Asami's still in ICU. His BP has picked up. And yesterday he was cold and clammy. Now he's, he's quite warm. He's there. Dr. Sundaraj says that if Perry Asami pulls through, it could take perhaps a month to fully recover with return visits for follow-up care. Since this patient is on ventilator, the cost will be higher for him, and the antibiotics, we are going for a higher antibiotics. So this man, uh, his cost will be around 60 to 70 thousands. That's more than $1,000 for only these first few days of acute care. That money is going to save his life. So that is the only thing anyway, we asked to spend for his life. Even Dr. Sundaraj is concerned about the cost and quality of anti-venom being produced in India. We have to create an anti-snake venom which is not producing any anaphylactic reactions. It's been a rough life. They've lost one child. Perry is Sammy's wife is disabled from polio. And now, this unexpected reality begins to sink in. <laughs> I'm only asking God and wonder why this had to happen. I don't know what we have done for this to have to happen. As a baker, Perry Sammy makes less than $5 a day, working only a few days a week. In the past few hours, his wife has managed to secure money from relatives for only one third of the anticipated costs. I can't sell anything and I can't work either. The only option is that he works and repays the loan. But if Perry Sammy doesn't fully recover, all is lost, especially for their little girl. My daughter cried because she saw her father in that state. She's very attached to him. She loves him a lot. So to look at him in that condition, she cried and started asking me, is he going to come home tomorrow? <laughs> True prophet of style. Yeah, powerful. Can you imagine some poor little African child with that happening? Dr. Harrison has returned from his Kenyan research trip. He's one of a handful of scientists around the globe racing to find a solution. It's amazing that that little amount of venom is enough to kill one in five people, isn't it? This is the Alistair Reed Venom Research Unit at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine in Northern England. Here, Dr. Harrison and head herpetologist Paul Rowley extract the venom of 450 snakes captured in the wild throughout Africa. There are 21 different uh, species of venomous snake in Africa that cause deaths, that cause disabilities, and cause mental health problems. And generating a, a single therapy for that number of quite different venomous snakes is a real challenge. So black neck spitting cobra, very large. Anti-venom has to be manufactured specifically for the kind of snakes that you want to try to treat. So if someone's been bitten by a viper, they need a viper anti-venom. And a cobra anti-venom is not going to work. So what we're trying to do is make a single anti-venom for the whole of sub-Saharan Africa that is effective against all of those snakes that does not require a cold chain, 
so you don't have to have refrigerators in all your different hospitals, and that will be affordable. This pan-African anti-venom will be highly refined and effective with little risk of side effects. The goal is to sell it cheaper than the Indian anti-venoms in circulation throughout Africa. Harrison hopes this long-term solution will hit the market in as little as five years. But it in no way caters for the deaths and the disabilities that are happening right now in Africa. <laughs> it's no question such a breakthrough would change the course of treatment for six-year-old Kamket. If private anti-venom manufacturers aren't going to produce pan-African serums like these, who in the world will? The answer just might be found throughout Central and South America. After all, one would think snake bite is a huge problem. There's the jungles, the Amazon, the rainforests. But in this part of the world, affordable anti-venoms are produced by numerous public institutions. Along with strong commitments by government health ministries, snake bite deaths and disabilities have been kept in check. The way in Latin America we have uh, confronted this problem through research, through production of anti-venom, it can be considered a model for other parts of the world. Professor Jose Maria Gutierrez has guided the successful deployment of safe, affordable, and effective anti-venoms all around the world. In the last years, our institute has been producing 100,000 vials of anti-venom per year. With that kind of output, you'd think this is a private pharmaceutical company. Instead, this production happens at a university, the University of Costa Rica. Instituto Clomiro Picado initially started producing antivenoms for Costa Rica during the decades on the decade of 1970. Then, as we gain experience in the technological development of antivenoms, improvement of antivenom innovation, then we expanded our production capacity to cover the rest of Central America. So now we are distributing our antivenom to Ecuador. And it doesn't stop there. This product we sell to, to Nigeria, Burkina Faso, and Mali uh, by $22 per vial. So this compares very favorably with other products which are sold by more than $100, $100, $200 per vial. In 2005, at the request of the Nigerian government, Costa Rica developed an anti-venom effective against three West African snakes. We get the venoms from Nigeria through the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. We use these venoms to immunize these horses here in Costa Rica. And, we, and then with the antivenom that we manufacture here in Costa Rica, we send this antivenom back to Nigeria to save lives there. We are at the farm of Instituto Clomiro Picado, where we keep more than 100 horses for the production of antivenom. Each group is injected with a different type of venom or venom mixture. Our co-workers here, they know which horses are being immunized with the African venoms, which horses are being immunized with the Latin American venoms. Getting this drug is a human right. It's not a matter of economic business. So if you do not introduce in this equation the concept of social profitability, social impact, uh, it is very difficult for a private company to uh, get into this field of antivenoms. It's a matter of using science for what it should be used, for the well-being of people. This compassionate model allows Jose and his team to expand their success even farther, this time to the South Pacific. They're about to introduce a new anti-venom to combat the deadly Taipan. It'll be a game changer in Papua New Guinea. Dr. David Williams has been rewriting the story of snake bite here for the past 15 years. The plight on this island is no different than in Africa or Asia. What is different 
is that something's being done about it. Really, most of the work that we've done has been as a result of identifying particular problems and then finding solutions for them. This is the capital city of Port Moresby. It's here where Williams wears many hats. He's the one you want treating you if you arrive at Port Moresby General Hospital. He's the CEO of the Global Snake Bite Initiative, the world's largest snake bite advocacy website. He also oversees the University of Melbourne funded Charles Campbell Toxinology Center. Here, his team, which includes Papua New Guinea scientists, extract venom from this, one of the world's deadliest, responsible for 90% of island bites. The taipans are really nervous snakes, so the best way to explain it is it doesn't start fights, it finishes them, which means they can bite you through your trousers, bite you through a pair of run -ears. So if you were to be bitten by a taipan snake today, this is the anti-venom that you'd probably be treated with. It's made by CSL, an Australian company. It's a really good anti-venom. And in the recent past, it's, it's cost as much as 1,500 to 2,000 US dollars a vial. The Costa Rican Taipan anti-venom has just finished clinical trials. At a cost of $150, it could be released as early as 2019. It's performed equally as well as the, the Australian product has. We would expect at a minimum that Papua New Guinea would be able to get four or five times more of this product for the same amount of money. If we can basically make this work in Papua New Guinea, which is very resource poor, then the same model could be made to work anywhere in the world. It's no good just having an anti-venom if nobody can access it. So you really have to build up the other things that are a part of a health system to be able to deliver that service. Otherwise, you're still not going to solve the problem. One of those solutions is improving transportation to the hospital. And that's where David's custom snake bite response ambulance comes in. What we do is we basically bring the most important part of the hospital for a, a dangerously ill snake bite patient all the way out to them. We carry ventilators, patient monitoring equipment. We've got the ability to, to intubate a patient's airway, literally on the side of the road if we have to. This vehicle has cost us nearly 300,000 US dollars, but it makes it possible for us to save somewhere between 60 and 100 people a year who otherwise would die of snake bite. We get calls generally in the middle of the night. It's a little bit like Murphy's Law. You know, they never call you in the daytime. And they generally wait until the person is as sick as they're possibly going to get without dying. And then they hope that you're going to get there in time. Time is what it's all about. What if scientists could develop an out-of-the-box scientific breakthrough? G'day, how are you? Something that gave victims more time. Cheap enough to keep in rural homes or in the farmer's pocket. Our goal is to build a bridge to survival. We're building the bridge from bite to hospital. It's not anti-venom. There are no horses, no farms. It's a field antidote to slow down the effects of venom. It doesn't require refrigeration, and it can be taken orally. What we're doing is an antidote. In Northern California, Dr. Matt Lewin believes he's found one key component to make this, a drug compound shelved before it ever hit market, never intended for anything related to snake bite. The compound is called verisplodib, otherwise known as LY315920. It was designed to treat heart disease and sepsis. This drug was never approved by the FDA, not because it wasn't safe, but because it, it turned out for what it was being used, it was not especially effective. Discovering it amongst thousands of compounds long forgotten was like finding a needle in a haystack. The results that we got initially were so striking, they were hard to believe. 
And so we contracted out this work to the Yale University Center for Molecular Discovery to validate our findings. And the most important aspect of this is not that we were able to do it, it's that somebody else was able to do it. And validate it, they did. Yale tested it against 4,000 other compounds. Right. LY315920 was king of the hill, blocking venoms that cause victim bleeding and paralysis. As it turns out, it seems to be quite effective against one of the major components of snake venoms. To date, we've tested LY315920 around 35 venoms. Of those 35 venoms, we've done validation on 28 of them. 28 venoms from six continents. Four different types of cobra, all of India's big four killers, many medically important snakes of sub-Saharan Africa, Papua New Guinea's coastal Taipan, and names of species that claim lives and limbs all around the globe. Lewin hopes to begin human clinical trials before the next monsoon, a time when snake bites are rampant. Whether it by itself will save lives remains to be seen, but it has promise. We've found no reason to turn back in any experiment we've done. So what can be done to save lives while scientists race to find these new and improved treatments? The best way to avoid snake bite is to prevent it from happening in the first place. And the right way to do that is through educating people. This is the reason why People get bitten by snakes all the time. Bare feet, bare feet, thongs, bare feet. Shoes is good. Shoes, trousers is even better. The best way not to get bitten is to wear shoes and trousers. The fact that somebody's lying in the, in the village cemetery dead from snake bite doesn't necessarily translate back to their need for footwear. This 60-person roadside village where children play in taipan infested grasses is a prime example. A respected elder died from a snake bite on his way to Port Moresby. Yeah, I remember Stephen Mocker, yeah. That's right. Yeah, I was in the hospital when he arrived. The problem was that when they put him in the truck, he was laying on his back. And when his tongue, and this got paralyzed and he couldn't, he couldn't push it out anymore, it fell backwards and blocked his air. So it's just an important lesson to remember if somebody else ever gets bitten, Always, if you put them in a vehicle, lay them on their side. They're just something to remember. We might start with 10% of people following what we say, but eventually it'll be 20%, and then 30 and 50 and 70 and 80. And as those numbers grow, the numbers of snake bites will go the opposite way. So there are simple, inexpensive messages that could be conveyed through health education networks if if the authorities felt that snake bite was worth spending this time on. There's no excuse for somebody dying of snake bite in this day and age. And that doesn't matter whether they're in Papua New Guinea, the United States of America, Thailand, Nigeria, Ghana, Swaziland, India. There's just no excuse for it. We've got the science, we've got the technology, we've got the people who have the heart to make sure that these solutions become available. We just need people to invest in a solution for the people of their country. If we are to save lives, our limbs, this is the time for the whole world to wake up to this important uh, problem that has for many years lingered with no interest. It's up to the ministers of health and governments in snakebite endemic countries to get the ball rolling. They must make snakebite a priority so the WHO can create donor funded programs to tackle snakebite. On behalf of us all, thank you very much, thank Governor. You. Thank you, Dr. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. After years of being the world's most ignored way to die, Snake bites moment in time may have finally arrived. Well, in a month from now, we're leaving Papua New Guinea to go to Geneva 
to uh, present a case for, for recognition of snake bite by the World Health Organisation at the World Health Assembly. It's probably the best chance we're going to have any time in the next decade to get snake bite properly on the world's radar and to see any real chance that there will be a program to do something about it on a global level. Going from here to Geneva is, is not about me. It's not about the, the other scientists who are going to come from places like Costa Rica or even Angola or Nigeria. It's actually about the victims of snake bite. It's got nothing to do with us. We're there to, to represent them. This is our make or break opportunity. Of course, we still have to win the case. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to attend this very important activity. A snake bite in Venomin affects millions of people living in poverty for too long. This public health crisis has been underestimated, neglected, forgotten, or positively denied. Why should snake bite deserve urgent attention and action now? The burden of morbidity and mortality is enormous, yet the investment in research and in interventions is actually minuscule by comparison. This global tragedy is a direct result of the lack of political recognition and coordinated action at all levels of the world's global public health community. So what does it take? It needs political will. It needs some prioritisation and policy inclusion. And the only organisation that can do that is the World Health Organisation. We strongly believe that the fight to control the burden of snake bite suffering would be greatly assisted by the re-inclusion of snake bite on the neglected tropical diseases list. No person should be condemned to a life of poverty simply because they were unfortunate enough to be bitten by a snake. In the 90 minutes that it's taken us to have this meeting, 22 men, women and children will have lost their lives. So we invite you, the Member States, to take up the case for WHO recognition of snake bite in Venomy as a serious public health emergency. And I've been authorised to announce Nigeria's support for this great initiative. At this meeting, Dr. Sue Hill with the WHO acknowledged the need to do more for snake bite. But accurate statistics will still be needed to prove the magnitude of the problem and to help gain large donor funding. I think it's worth highlighting that our data are limited. And I think that's a challenge to the global community here to actually improve the data quality. It's worth noting that here at this 69th World Health Assembly, Mycetoma, a non-fatal skin disease long advocated to make the NTD list, got on the list, the 18th to receive a formal program. Even when the WHO claims the global burden cannot be determined accurately due to a lack of data. So how much more data on snake bite do we need to gather? How many more Chepkamins and Periasamis do we need to meet? How many more graves do we need to see? How many more voiceless victims will raise their hands to tell you their crisis will be the same tomorrow as it was the day before? How long will it take for a compassionate, problem-solving world to wake up before every government says, this is the time, before the WHO finally gets the resources it needs to be able to say, there's no stopping us now. What will it take to end that unbearable panic so a parent can finally say, you're going to survive instead of fearing 
you only have minutes to die.